Good afternoon. Um, thank you for joining everyone. My name is Iman. Um, I believe Matt is controlling the slides, so let's get straight in. Matt, next slide, please. Um, so Kenza, who are we? Um, we are an organization that's about 20 years, 22 years old now. We're based out in Truro in Cornwall. Um, we predominantly manufacture, well, we do manufacture heat pumps, ground source heat pumps specifically in the UK. We're one of two manufacturers. There's a group of three companies within Kenza. Um, so Kenza Contracting does the delivery piece where we engage with um, social landlords and uh, new build developers to install ground source heat pumps. Kenza Heat Pumps is our manufacturing division, which has a factory down in Truro in Cornwall. And we also have Kenza Utilities, which is an asset infrastructure business which owns funds and operates ground arrays that will probably become much clearer towards the end of the presentation when when i can clearly explain what the ground array is but essentially uh, we we have a way of being able to fund ground arrays as well uh, during COVID, we actually took a fairly uh, substantial share, 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 a shareholder on board with legal in general which has enabled us to do some of the kind of funding mechanisms that we're talking about today next slide please so uh, strategically um, and globally, we know we need to stop using fossil fuels to heat our homes. Um, at the moment, heating our homes accounts for roughly 20% of emissions, which is much more than cars. Um, heat pumps are being mentioned more and more and they're the front runner green technology to ha heat our homes. We're, we have a target of 600,000 heat pump installations by 2028 and we're all gearing up in terms of deployment for that. It's a substantial shift from where we are now, which is roughly around 30,000 heat pumps being sold a year. So we need to increase uh, our activity greatly. And also heat accounts for more energy use and CO2 emissions than either power or transport. So it's a big challenge and a lot of that is shifting fossil fuels out and to electrifying heat going forward. Next slide, please. So why ground source heat pumps? Um, if you keep clicking through, Matt, they're cheaper to run, quieter in operation, less maintenance and longer life. Um, and they're engineered in that way. They have less moving parts. They don't require long term maintenance in terms of the heat pump itself. Um, and they're much cheaper to run than other forms of electric heating. Uh, pretty comparable to gas at the moment because of the artificially low price of gas. But once we move away from subsidizing fossil fuels and uh, not charging for the carbon impact on those and shifting that away from electricity to gas. I think there'll be a rebalance, but they're, they're all like high level strategic stuff, which is going on a government at the moment. Next slide, please. So how does the ground source heat pump work? Essentially, um, you have a white box appliance. I think you need to click one more time, Matt. Thank you. Um, that collects ambient energy from the ground or from the air, but you know we were talking about ground source specifically. So the ambient energy is collected from the ground and it goes into the heat pump. And within the heat pump, there's a refrigerant. That refrigerant um, changes state from a liquid to a gas, uh, anything from minus 20 and above. That liquid that's vaporized, it becomes compressed in a compressor. And as you compress gases, they become hotter. Okay, that goes all the rooms in, yeah? Yeah, I'll finished. finished. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you compress the gases, they become hot, and then you have a heat exchange into a wet system within the building. So with ground source, you take two units of free energy from the ground and you use one unit of energy from your electricity meter to run the pumps and the compressor. Um, the ground is naturally recharged with solar energy and rainfall that makes it renewable. So that ground gets recharged every year. Um, and it's a much more efficient way of being able to source heat from an ambient system. Um, there are other ways of doing it as well, and we'll come on to those later on, but specifically doing vertical uh, ground loops are the most straightforward way of doing it. So if we move to the next slide. And again. Yeah, so 
this is our shoebox heat pump. This is what we manufacture um, the most of, and it's what's being used in some of the tower blocks that we're working on. Uh, it's also similarly being used in new build developments that are coming through. It's the size of an industrial microwave, um, and it can quite easily fit under a kitchen sink or in a cupboard or you know, in existing situations where you have a boiler in place in a, in a cupboard, and it's compatible with normal heating controls. If we move to the next slide, please. Yeah, and, and we, we try to keep controls as simple as possible. So we tend to put a thermostat programmer and TRVs on, but you are a, also able to combine smarter controls uh, that are able to learn usage within the residence property and be able to adapt in terms of when the heat comes on, when the hot water comes on. So there are various trials out there with smart technologies, but generally when we're looking at large scale retrofit, especially social housing, we try to keep things as, as easy to explain as possible and easy to operate as possible. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of system architecture, what you have is each property has its own heat pump so there isn't a plant room or anything like that each individual property will have one heat pump so if that one property requires heat it will collect some ambient energy from the ground loops which is uh, represented there by the vertical pipes that go down um, that energy goes into the heat pump it compresses it, it takes a large amount of ambient energy, compresses it into a small amount of usable heat, and each property has independent control of their heating and hot water system. That means if another property wants heating out of season, they can have it. It doesn't require the whole plant to be operating. That tends not to be any moving parts outside of the property either. So what you tend to have is a, a heat pump with a, a, a circulatory pump and divert valves within the building, within the actual property itself. And outside it's all pipes connected to risers that go up inside blocks. Uh, so that's what the system infrastructure looks like. If we move on to the next slide, please. And what we're able to do by using heat pumps and renewable energy, we're able to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels and imported gas. So it develops energy sovereignty within the UK. We can support green growth within the UK. And very importantly, we can reduce fuel poverty substantially within properties that are existing electrically heated buildings, which a lot of our property, a lot of our projects uh, do tackle. Please press another time. And also, you know, it is being deployed today. It's not a technology of the future. It's been around for a while. We're just looking at how we can scale this up in a city scale basis or a, or a uh, housing estate basis so that you get those economies of scale by doing mass retrofit at the same time. If we can move on. Uh, one more slide, please. So social housing, why it's important to us and why as a sector we, I feel we need to address this really quickly. You know, there's 4 million social homes within England. Um, average incomes are quite low and average rents, you know, around £7,000 a year. Once you've accounted for rent and average income, you know, at best you've got between five and £7,000 to live off. You know, at, English housing survey suggests that lots of people are finding it difficult to afford rent and up to 15% are in rent areas already. So having high cost heating and hot water within blocks that are socially let can be problematic. Um, there's lots of, there's around two, 220,000 properties that are in high rise accommodation, predominantly a large, large proportion of those are electrically heated. Um, so you have situations where residents are paying between 2,000 to 4,000 pounds a year for heating and hot water um, and easily within the limits of fuel poverty. You also have the added target of having to get to net zero by 2030 within social housing. So it's, there's lots of different things happening around affordability, around fuel poverty, around transitioning to net zero, reducing carbon impact. All of these can be addressed with a good retrofit strategy and decarbonisation of heat uh, with ground source heat pumps. If we can move on, please. Yeah, so, so some of the work we've done with the NEA in the past around training and around, you know, looking at what the situation is with particular fuel poor households. There's a big increase in fuel poverty. I think the, the recent numbers about six and a half million of 
potentially would be looking at eight and a half million um, next year where, or later this year with the price rises, price cap going up. But if you have electric storage heaters, you're running at a higher cost. Therefore, you're more impacted by this. Um, some of the residents that we've been talking to are paying 70 pounds a week to heat one room. So that's the equivalent of around 3,600 pounds a year, which is, which is a huge cost. And unfortunately, disproportionately impacts those who don't have the ability to change their heating systems because you know, usually in social uh, rented accommodation, they can't take the decision to do that. So what they tend to do is buy a plug-in electric heater and only use that and not use the heating system there. Um, so social landlords, they, have, they can have a huge impact here by installing cheaper to run renewable heating systems. I know there's some uh, existing challenges that need to be overcome in terms of capital cost, life cycle cost, and being able to develop that in terms of affordability for the council. And that's certainly something that we can help with. But actually by utilizing really good asset management and looking at life cycle costing, there's some of the barriers that we can overcome. And ground source heat pumps will provide you the lowest running cost heating of any heating system out there. Um, and providing you that 300% efficiency. If we can move to the next slide, please, man. So what are we doing in Forrock specifically? There are three tower blocks in Chadwell St. Mary, uh, 273 flats, and we're replacing electric night storage heaters with ground source heat pumps. We're drilling 109 boreholes um, into the car park and the soft spaces, the green spaces around there. Um, this part funded with social housing decarbonization fund, and we're able to support with business case development um, and social impacts by potentially doing some stuff with the community to give a little bit back. If we can move to the next slide. In terms of what we have been doing with Farrakh over the last couple of years, it can take a long time to develop a business case to do such large scale investments and transition to net zero. So we've supported in terms of being able to um, identify the business case, suggesting fuel poverty assessments take, care, take place to understand the, uh, the gravity of the situation that some of the residents are in. We're able to provide feasibility studies um, at no cost so that it can support with some of those strategic discussions that need to be had. Uh, we can provide detailed design um, at a cost, which helps drive uh, your kind of investment decision in terms of having an accurate cost to potentially utilize. And we can also support applications through social housing decarbonization fund, various different funding schemes as well. Um, and essentially what we do is we project manage an installation from start to finish. We're also on lots of different procurement frameworks to make that kind of procurement cycle a little bit more simple. If you can move to the next slide, I believe we're looking at the tour now. So I'm going to stop talking for a minute and hopefully you can enjoy the tour um, in the comfort of your offices or homes uh, and we'll come back and we'll continue there. If you can press play, please. Good morning, my name is Iman Barmanki and I work for Kenza Contracting. We are here today at Shadow St. Mary in Farrakh, where we are retrofitting three tower blocks with ground source heat pumps connected to shared ground dry. The residents in these blocks all have electric storage heaters and are currently experiencing really high heating and hot water bills. With energy price cap having been lifted and energy prices going up, many residents are finding themselves in fuel poverty. What we're doing here is replacing those storage heaters with ground source heat pump and connected to a shared ground array. This system is much more efficient, it's quiet in operation, and often we see a 50% or more saving in heating bills and a 70% reduction in carbon emissions. For us, it's really important to engage with our residents that we're working with to demonstrate how the system works. And it can often be challenging to demonstrate that with technology when it's not visualized. So what we've done here is put a mock-up room in place where we can demonstrate how the ground array is installed, how the pipework is connected to the block. And this is the layout that people have within their properties, a shoebox, heat pump at the bottom, sun amp heat battery, and all the controls that go along with it. 
each property will have their own thermostat and programmer so they can have full control of how they run the heating system. The radiators will be fitted with thermostatic radiator valves so they can turn individual radiators up or down depending on the rooms that they're using. And overall what we're trying to do is give them much more comfort and by providing affordable warmth these residents will be lifted not only out of fuel poverty but hopefully will have better health as well. Here we are at the first stage of the installation process with the drilling of the boreholes to provide the energy to the ground source heat pumps. So here we've got a Camacho 602 drilling rig, drilling hole number 70 on the site so far. We've got 109 boreholes to drill on the site to provide all of the energy we need to heat all of the flats uh, within the three tower blocks here at Chavel St Mary. So the drilling technique we're using here is what we call mud flush. We're just inserting the rods here at the moment, ready to start drilling again today. We connect each of the rods together and that's all connected to the mud cleaning equipment. We basically pump the water from there down through the drilling rods to the bottom of the drill head where we drill the rock as we go. That water then pushes the cuttings, the risings that we've just drilled from the hole up the outside of the hole and into the box at the top here. That muddy water is then pumped away through a set of filters take all the cuttings out and then we circulate the same water through to retain the drilling process. So each of the boreholes is drilled to an average of 258 metres. Once the borehole has been drilled to depth, uh, it's then time to insert the borehole probe. We've got a continuous length of 45mm HDB pipe work with a fusion weld connection at the bottom. That probe is lowered into the hole. It's metre marked so we know that we've got the probe all the way to the bottom. Once that probe's installed, and pressure tested, we then backfill with a bentonite grout. So we just backfill the hole that we've drilled with that compound to make sure that we get thermal conductivity in between the pipe and the ground around it. We drill each hole in around two days and move the rig around the site and keeping all the central mud cleaning equipment in the same place. For this particular site, we've actually got three rigs in operation, trying to move around the site as quickly as possible so we can give the car parking back to the residents. At this stage we're installing the riser pipework to connect the ground arrays into the individual apartments. So here uh, in the corner we've got the risers that come up through each floor. We have a fusion weld T at the top here where we tee off to provide the flow and return to serve the laterals which then serve all of the individual heat pumps on this floor. So to allow us to do this work, um, we have to do a structural survey of each floor to detect where the structural reinforcement is for the floor up through the tower block. In this particular block, the rebar, the reinforcement was actually pretty inconsistent across the floor, which made it challenging to provide a route up for the pipe work all the way through the building. So what we've done is we've put some reinforcing bars on each floor just to maintain the structural integrity, which has allowed us to drill a straight riser all the way up through each individual floor. And the next stage will be to lag it. So we'll put a vapour barrier insulation on all of the pipe work. And then finally, we'll box that all in, um, hide it away so it's looking nice when we finish. So from the risers, we have the main lateral pipe work that comes through into the corridors here. We've converted into carbon steel pipe work with press fit that runs at high level all the way through the corridors into each individual apartment. Once we've completed all the pipe work, we'll fully lag all of this pipe work again um, to prevent condensation and from any exposed pipe work. And once that work's complete, we'll fire stop in between any of the entry points into the dwellings, but also between any of the entry points through the corridors. Once we've teed off into each individual apartment, we come into the uh, five-way valve arrangement here. What this allows us to do through this set of valves is to close the two valves into the apartment and actually circulate flow from here all the way down through the ground array. And that allows us to flow and pressure test the whole of that circuit ahead of the internal installation. And we'll do that for each set of laterals and on each floor through the building. At that point, once we're ready to undertake the installation, we can isolate the risers. The heat pumps will be installed and connections into the flow and returns here. We can then open these three valves and flow and pressure test from the heat pump through this circuit. Once that's done and we know that the heat pump's ready to set to run and commission, and because we've got flow, we'll basically open these four valves close the one in the middle and that's the system ready to run and circulate flow from the heat pump all the way down through the laterals, risers and then into the boreholes. Um, my name's Diane Barr and I've been here 16 years and yeah the heating is it's a big expense. It's at the moment it's because obviously rates have gone up it's about £70 a week that's just the heating that's not doing washing or drying or anything like that. So yeah, and it's going to make a big difference, no heating. It's been bad, like windows get wet, 
and we wipe them every morning, you know, so kitchen's freezing, they should put cooker on. Yeah, it's going to make a hell of a difference, being able to put it on when I want to and turn it off and have a bit of heat in the bedrooms without having to put extras on, you know what I mean? Because storage heat is so overnight, so if you forget to put it on, you've got no heat the next day. Really please, about time, I could say, yeah. I'm, I'm Colin Bridges and I've lived here 13 years and the heating is unbelievable, you know what I mean? <sighs> oh, gets me down sometimes, going and putting money on the electric and all this, I mean, should have been, I think this should have been sorted out a long time ago. I mean, 13 years I've had to live cold, in the coldest. I, I don't even want to go down that road with the heating because it's literally a joke. I mean, when it's done, I'll be happy. I'll be an happy person. We literally can't afford to put the heating on, the heaters on. Because you just swallow me, swallow me money. It'll make a lot of difference to my life. It will make a lot of difference. Oh, much warmer. Be lovely. Be lovely. Hello, I'm Matthew Trewella. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Kenza Group. Although this project is in social housing, it can act as a blueprint for how we decarbonise heating across the UK. Shared ground arrays and networked heat pumps can be funded completely separately. So you can put the infrastructure in the ground as a utility funded concept, and then properties can connect one by one as they're ready. So we can displace the gas grid in an orderly fashion in exactly the same way that the gas grid was put in and displace coal heating. So right here, all the properties are going to connect on day one, and that's why it's easier to deploy this in social housing right now. But fast forward even just a few years, and we think by 2028, this type of approach will be being rolled out across cities and towns across the UK. And I believe that's the end of the tour. Matt, if we can move on to the next slide. So I hope that that was informative and helped you to kind of visualize uh, a, an installation of this scale. Um, as Matt touched on the video in terms of our vision for the future, we, we see this becoming a network of ambient energy pipes that are buried into the ground, enabling different buildings to be able to connect and utilizing different sources of heat as well. So we can move on to the next slide. Um, we can potentially be looking at a network which runs at anywhere between zero to 20 degrees, each individual property having its own heating and hot water system. You can potentially run passive and active cooling on the same system as well. So you could operate a passive cooling system or you could run an active cooling system by operating the heat pump in reverse. This is very much something for the future. It's not something that's happening on these blocks, but it's definitely something that can be put in. Um, waste heat and cold from different types of buildings can be recycled into that network so you might have a data center somewhere you might have a leisure center or supermarket that has a cooling load which is expelling heat out of the building that could go into the network and that heat could potentially be used to provide heating of water somewhere else and most importantly um, the heat pumps are connected directly to the individual property's electric meter so there isn't a need for heat metering and billing we're not we're not selling heat we are using an appliance to generate heat within someone's home so each individual resident is in full control of being able to switch to the cheapest tariff possible and um, basically control how they use their heating system so they're encouraged therefore to be much more efficient with the way they use their heating system uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so we've discussed um, already and you would have seen from the video shared ground loops. They, these are closed loop boreholes which can be deployed into the earth, uh, tends to be used up to 300 meters deep and you could put a series of these together to get enough ambient energy for, for a building or an estate. There are other ways to do it as well. So if we move to the next slide, you can actually use open loop uh, and drill into an aquifer, so a body of water under underground. You can take some ambient energy out of that 
um, put it through a heat exchanger that feeds into that network to provide ambient energy. This has been done before. We have a few uh, tower blocks in Sunderland with Gentoo Housing Association, which are connected to an uh, aquifer. Uh, so that's a different source of ambient energy as well. It's a little bit more complicated in terms of having to get environment agency approval and uh, a fair bit of upfront costs. So we tend to favor the ground loops because they're much more straightforward and you know you can deploy those without the upfront cost. Uh, so you know the, the approvals can take nine months to get in place if you wanted to do an aquifer system. We move on, please. Um, you can also use mine workings. So mine shafts that have been abandoned, they tend to be filled up with water. Again, you can uh, take out ambient energy from the water there. And our factory in Cornwall is on the site of a disused tin mine. So the factory, the office space, all of that is heated with a ground source heat pump connected to the mine workings actually. So this is much more applicable in the north, which, which has lots of um, coal mines that are abandoned now and also in the, in the southwest with lots of tin mines actually. But again, similarly, you need to consider the structural integrity of the mine. You need to get coal authority approval. So again, it can be quite costly to, to deploy it and you know, much more straightforward to the shared ground loops. But again, it's another ambient, uh, another form of ambient energy, which uh, is being investigated much more readily now. And the next slide, please, which is another source of ambient energy, which is lakes, rivers, and even the open sea. So you could potentially bury pipework into the base of a, into the bottom of a lake and take ambient energy out of the lake, uh, a river that's wide enough and deep enough, uh, potentially even open sea in the south coast is something that we've been looking at doing as well. Next slide. Um, and yeah, essentially all of those sources of different sources of energy, ambient energy could be fed back into a network and we're calling it a networked heat pump. So it's a heat pump that's connected to a network of ambient pipes. You can use different technologies such as solar panels, PVT panels, which can provide heating, but basically they, they cool the solar panel as it's generating electricity. By doing that, you're generating more electricity, but you're also collecting ambient energy from the base of the solar panel, which you can recycle and put back into the network. So lots of different ways of doing it. In central London, you could potentially use waste heat from underground shafts, uh, ventilation shafts to recycle that back into the network as well. Next slide, please. In terms of how we support um, social landlords, there's various ways that we can get involved, whether it's from soft market testing to developing feasibilities or looking at funding support. Um, we can work with officers in terms of developing robust business cases. We can look at focusing on social impact in terms of being able to tackle those harder to treat, um, higher cost running systems first. Um, and like I said, we're on various different procurement frameworks as well in terms of being able to utilize those frameworks. But we're also really keen to have that uh, integrated approach with, where we look at not only just the heat pump itself, but how that can integrate with heat storage, with battery storage, with time of use tariffs and potential demand side response. So being able to shift demand from times of high electricity cost to lower cost by being able to store heat locally as well. If we can move on, next slide, please. Uh, we're also deploying this technology in non-domestic buildings. So we, we've got lots of different projects that we've done. Um, we've worked with Northumberland County Council doing fire, fire stations, schools. Uh, we're actively working on public sector decarbonisation scheme as well to look at leisure centres, town hall, civic centres as well. But it's not just limited to the domestic dwellings. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is uh, another case study of the project that we did with Sunder with Gentoo in Sunderland. So these tower blocks are linked in with uh, in into an aquifer, which is about 60 meters below ground. And what you see in that picture is a sun amp, and at the back of that picture, you see, sorry, the the front bit, the, the middle picture, you see a heat pump and a sun amp, and that's exactly the same type of system that's going to be installed in Forex. Uh, this, this week we're installing the internal, so unfortunately I haven't managed to get any pictures of the internal uh, uh, installations uh, at Farrakh, but we can follow up with that uh, if, in the next time if, if needs be. Next slide, please. One more minute, Iman. Um, there's also other uh, pro pro projects that we've done where we've looked at mass scale retrofit across all electrically heated buildings with Together Housing, for example, where we've got, got up to around 800 units. Next slide. 
Yes, and in conclusion, um, ground source heat pumps can offer the lowest carbon emissions. Um, they're being installed at scale using ambient loops today. So it's a tried and tested solution. We know it works. We can alleviate fuel poverty in millions of households. Funding is available through social housing decarb fund and also the public sector decarbonisation scheme. Um, and if you are looking at a funded solution for Kenzie utilities, potentially we could fund the installation of the ground array um, in return for a annual connection fee per property in the same way that the gas network operates today where you have a gas meter and a standing charge. So that can potentially be used as a method of funding the ground array and taking a big chunk of the upfront cost out. Uh, and I think that's my slides finished. Thank you so much, Eman, and thank you so much for putting together a really interesting video as part of that. And really it is that it's that potential for this technology to cut costs as well as cutting carbon for people in social housing. And that's why Ashton was so excited by this and gave it an award. Um, there are quite a lot of examples of ground source heat pumps going into very wealthy owner occupier homes, people who've got a lot of money who need to he heat a big home. Uh, but historically, there haven't been as many applications it, that, that have been suitable for social housing. So it's very exciting to see this happen. And having actually been and visited in person, I think we were all really surprised at how relatively undisruptive it is. We actually saw the active drilling in the car park. I'd imagine it would be noisy. I imagined it would be a bit of a nightmare for the residents while this is going on, but it's incredibly quiet. And I think I'm right in saying all of this happens without anybody having to be decanted from their home. Isn't that correct? pretty much, uh, but we'll come on to that in a moment when we hear from the council. So do please put your questions in the chat. We'll be coming back to Iman after we've heard from our next speakers. So any questions you've got, pop into the chat and we'll come back to those in a moment. Uh, but next, I'm delighted to hand over to Evelina and Alistair from Thurrock Council. Evelina is the Director of Housing and Alistair is the Strategic Lead for Assets, Repairs and Compliance, who will give us the council's perspective on why they've chosen this solution for their tenants. Thanks. Thank you so much, um, Emma, and uh, good afternoon to you all. Uh, good to see some familiar names in, in on the list. So good to good to see uh, 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 colleagues from the past. So uh, I will be very brief. Just a little bit about Thera Council. Um, obviously, you you've seen quite a lot of visuals. Uh, we have got only uh, uh, sort of a handful or so of uh, tower blocks and we definitely selected this grouping of three for those work. So my name is Evelina Subjan, I'm currently the Director of Housing and I'll be joined by my colleague Alistair Wood, who is the Strategic Lead for Assets Repairs and Compliance, uh, to talk about that. And I'm trying to do the... That you put yourself on mute, Evelina. There we go. Now off mute. So uh, very briefly about us. We're not that big, 175,000 uh, 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 people. We're not that far from City of London and, and sort of just outside of M25. Loads of green belt. It's really a selection of villages and small towns. Uh, huge growth opportunity. Uh, we um, have got the riverfront and we are the lead name for the Thames Freeport, currently in a lot of financial difficulties, but I'm sure a lot of you have seen on the news, but sort of working through it. However, in housing, we're still sort of well placed to carry on the sort of complex and interesting um uh, sort of projects that we've got on the go. So this is just a little bit more. So you've got you, you sort of London here. We're just here, and and a few more starts um, about us. We've got ten thousand council homes, and uh, and it's a really big selection of just sort of street houses, uh, and then a proportion of low rise. Uh, buildings and, and and a handful of, of um, high rise, as I said, it was very important for us and, and you will hear from Alistair that we actually um, prepare for uh, net zero as much as we can, that we invest in our housing stock uh, uh, fairly regularly and fairly sort of consistently so that um, we can really uh, uh, sort of with residents in mind uh, award the sort of right type of um, accommodations 
safe accommodation uh, and as efficient and modern as possible. So I'll hand over to um, Alistair to talk about how it all started with this particular initiative. Thank you, Evelina. Good afternoon, everyone. So um, as Evelina said, um, you know, our drive is very much a balance in terms of reducing carbon, getting rid of net carbon zero, but also to support our residents, which we recognise a number of um, unfortunately sitting in fuel poverty. So this would this um, slide here is really just a statement that we apply to all of our um, programmes and projects that we deliver in Thurrock and essentially it's ensuring that any investment that we do is actually to support the long-term objective for our um, housing asset but also to support the residents in terms of maintaining and improving their homes so it's a, a healthy environment for them and their family to live in but as I said also reduction of fuel poverty. Next one please Evelina. So in relation to the Chapel Tower blocks, we were looking across our portfolio and looking at some of the most sort of vulnerable residents and cohorts. And, you know, most of them, I think, would recognise that live in sort of tower blocks. And um, none of our tower blocks, we've got 15 tower blocks in the borough, none of them have gas central heating in them. They've all got electric storage radiators. Um, of which are you know quite renowned in terms of costly for operation and running for residents. So we were looking across the, our portfolio and sort of have recognised that these uh, storage heaters were over 30 odd years old. The controls within them are very limited for residents and also the sort of ongoing running costs and there's one the residents identified in that video, you know, that operational aspect for them, um, for them to actually effectively heat their home meant that we do recognise that there's a real disproportionate portion of heating within residents homes especially in tower blocks where they've got Norwich storage radiators and therefore that has a knock-on impact in terms of health and well-being but also mold and damp which is obviously prevalent across the industry at the minute so you know we, we looked at this and we sort of identified a number of options that potentially we could look at for replacing the heating system to support our residents and so we've done that sort of due diligence exercise a bit of a SWOT analysis between different options and that included a bit of market research with partnering um, contractors such as Kensinale. And we actually went down the ground source heat pump route again because it supports the sort of a drive towards net carbon zero, but also the longer term benefits. And as Amman pointed out, it still gives the residents complete um, control in terms of that operation of the system and their cost and what provider they can go to of electricity, etc. Next slide, please, Olina. So when at the inception of this project, we also undertook um, a, a sample handful of um, fuel poverty assessments. So at the time, you see there that there's 57% of the residents out of the 67 that we looked at were actually in fuel poverty. And that was actually before the current pressures around the energy sector. And therefore, you know, it's one again, it's one of the main drivers, you know, every, absolutely we need to focus on carbon reduction. But, you know, especially if we're in social housing at the moment, we really need to concentrate on residents and supporting them as much as possible. So therefore, we done undertook a full feasibility for this. So it gave us a sort of real good basis in terms of what we're going to approach for this scheme. Um, and then as it come along, and I think Amman touched on it in the slide, we actually managed to it, it sort of fell a little bit hand in hand. It wasn't, I'd be in line if I told you it was completely planned, but we were able to gain funding for this under SHDF Wave 1. Um, we got £3.2 million pound from the government to deliver this project, obviously, which have, is significant in terms of the overall project costs, but also allows us to continue to be able to um, invest in our stock and hopefully we'll have future success under SHDF as well. <laughs> 